Yo, yo, it's John Hope Bryant, and this is the Money and Wealth podcast series on iHeartRadio, brought to you by the Black Effect Network. And uh, I'm excited today about this podcast. It's How I Failed series. How I Failed, that's right. Everybody uh, thinks about and talks about, I don't know if they think about it, but they talk about when they introduce me, they talk about my successes when I give a speech or in a meeting. I'm very honored. Uh, I guess some people are proud of me and they talk about all of my successes, but I'm not defined by my successes. No one, no so-called successful person is defined by their successes. You're defined by how you manage your failures, right? Life is 10% what life does to you and 90% how you choose to respond to it. What's your response going to be? You've heard me say, if you listen to me at all, that I take no for vitamins. Uh, I, I believe that success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Over, around it, and through it, I'm going to get to it. Nothing is going to keep me down or keep me or hold me back. Nothing. Now, that's great philosophy. Now, you heard me say, again, if you listen or follow my podcast, you've heard me say that rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. All these things you've heard me say, if you've listened, followed me, you've heard me say these things, but they sound like platitudes. They sound like something out of a cereal box. They sound like some motivational series, you know, motivational saying that maybe I was I got from reading a book or or listening to some motivational speaker. Not true. No, 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 no. You've heard me say I was homeless if you listen to me. That doesn't seem to resonate with people. They th think it's something, some, oh, you know, I, that, was he really homeless? I'll get into that in another part of this podcast, not this one today. This one is specifically around my business failure. Uh, it's going to be, again, how I failed. This is part one. So there'll be several parts of how I failed. And this one's called falling forward. I want anybody watching this who's trying to be aspirational in business or trying to pursue a career are trying to pursue an occupation, um, certainly trying to do something that no one's ever done before. People say that you cannot do. I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that that, that you can do anything that you set your mind to, right? And this is a, a lot about mindset. My, my last book, Financial Literacy for All, and I want everybody who does has not already bought it to buy it. It's number, it came out number one in business or nonfiction on Publishers Clearinghouse and USA Today number i think eight or nine overall in usa today top you know top 10 when it came out and it's still number one in several categories online including amazon in business and economics and business finance right and and so here's a here's a person of color who's achieving bestseller status as a friend of mine who's ceo of a bank said without being an economist <laughs> bestseller status and he's not an economist and if you haven't guessed I'm black. <laughs> so, you know, did a bunch of stuff that people said cannot be done. Um, but again, this is focusing on supposedly my successes. I'm telling you that my successes were defined or my successes were made easier or achievable because of how I managed my failures. And I've always tried to fall forward, but I have fallen. I have, I have gotten very close to the edge several times. Uh, my credit, I know what a, a bad credit score is. I had one. <laughs> my credit was toe up from the floor up. I was so poor at one point, I couldn't afford an OR. I wasn't poor, I was just po, P-O. <laughs> yes, me, John Hope Bryant. So let's now get into um, the the details, right? Again, my this book, Financial Literacy for All, if you haven't bought, bought the book, buy one for yourself. If you already own one yourself, I want you to get a book put it in the name of your family, uh, put the, write the name of your family or your name on the inside of the book and donate that book to a Title I school, a poor, struggling, underserved school in, or this is, it's not a struggling school, but an under-resourced school in your neighborhood or a public library in your name and then offer to go in and volunteer and teach uh, because kids model what they see. Watch how you live your life. It may be the only Bible anybody else reads. Can I get an amen? Um, people model what they see. And I want you to help give these kids something different to see. The book before this was Up From Nothing, my personal story. 
the closest thing to an autobiography uh, of my life so far. I've got six books, three of which were absolute bestsellers, four were technical bestsellers. Um, and um, in that book, I talk about, in the book before that, the memo, I talk about mindset. Well, the memo is the business plan we never got. Up from nothing deals a lot with mindset and my failures, not my successes. Financial literacy for all is your toolbox, the operational software to succeed. But I want to to weave together the rest of these, um, the rest of this rest of this fabric for you, because all too often, uh, when somebody becomes successful, you don't relate to them anymore, or you don't think you do. You admire them. You maybe want to be like them. But maybe you don't think you can achieve what they've achieved because, you, well, all you see is success. And that's not the way this thing works. Hank Aaron, who lived around the corner from me, got rest his soul. His wife, Billy Aaron, is a friend of our family. We hang out with her. Um, got rest his soul. Billy, Bill, uh, you know, Hank Aaron had the record for the most, the most what? Home runs. He also had the record for the most strikeouts. You cannot hit a bat. Sorry, you cannot hit a ball that that bat has not swung at. Success has a thousand mothers, but failure is a bastard child. It's an old Southern quote. No one's going to remember your failure, so don't worry about it. They will celebrate you. They will they will salute, they will applaud, or they will be jealous of your successes. But, but, but success is the greatest revenge, um, and haters make you better. So don't focus on... Um, what other people say. Don't focus on what you think you cannot do. Don't focus on your so-called failures. You're not a failure. You just had an experiment that didn't end well. You're not a mistake. You might've made a mistake. We're all angels with dirty faces, right? A saint is a sinner that got up. Are we preaching yet? Okay, let's get into this first, um, how I failed part one, uh, how I failed series part one, which is falling forward. And specifically, this is my Operation Hope. Now, anybody knows me knows I've created 40 or 50 enterprises. There are currently five or six divisions of, of, of my organization, uh, uh, Operation Hope. I'm sorry, Brian, John Hope, Brian Holdings, which includes Operation Hope, Brian Group Digital Media, um, Brian Group Real Estate, Brian Group Ventures, uh, Brian Group Advisors. That's all part of, part of uh, uh, Brian Group Ventures. Um, is something I'm missing. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing too much stuff. Uh, my affordable housing uh, uh, division. Um, and but but anybody who knows me, right? Uh, you know I'm absolutely passionate about Operation Hope, and it's the biggest of its organ uh, kind of of organization of its kind in the country today. It's the largest nonprofit financial literacy coaching organization in America. Uh, we've raised four point five billion dollars for the underserved. We have millions of clients. We have offices in almost every state in the country, certainly over 40 of the states, uh, hundreds of cities. Um, and I'll get into the scale in a minute, but I'll just tell you, we have 1,500 physical and satellite locations. We're the largest by far in the country. Uh, annual budget, just for that, that, that part of my operations, that budget is $70 million plus. When you roll up all of my different entities, uh, we probably have, um, you know, 90 million, give or take, of annual turnover, annual economic activity. And directed $4.7, $4.8 billion worth of capital into underserved neighborhoods, um, prime capital. Um, but it wasn't always this way. It was dang hard when I started with a $61,000 operating budget in South Central LA with Operation Hope after the Rodney King riots in 1992. And when I started in 1992, and actually that, that $61,000 operating budget was the success of that year. I actually started with a budget of zero. I had to borrow the money from my own company to start it because no one believed in it. People actually laughed at me. They literally laughed at me and said, this will never work, and rolled their eyes. Oh, here comes John Hope Bryant. Oh, financial literacy. Oh, capitalism. Oh, <laughs> right? they, just, they just would roll their eyes at me. And like, you know, I wasn't doing what everybody else was doing. I wasn't doing it the way they were doing it. I wasn't trying to help my community in a way that my community was used to being helped. Uh, they were used to seeing somebody trying to offer them a hand out, not a hand up. 
And none of these solutions that they were seeing were what I call scalable solutions. They weren't tied to a business plan. They certainly weren't tied to capitalism. Government has been the fairest uh, and most equitable tr uh, um, friend to the underserved communities, and specifically the Black community since slavery and Jim Crow um, era. And so uh, folks, rightly so, understandably so, leaned on civil rights and the government. And here comes a guy talking about silver rights and free enterprise and capitalism. The one thing that actually has eluded people or dogged them or treated them badly or undercut them or preyed on them because they never got the memo on money, free enterprise, and financial literacy, as I've said before, with the Freedmen's Bank of 1865, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All good reasons, right? Um, this is it, free enterprise has not been their friend. I mean, redlining was only in black communities. Uh, the, the Homestead Act didn't touch black and brown people. 99% of that uh, went to, um, to my mainstream brothers and sisters uh, who got all that land, um, which represents 10% of America. The, you know, the, the Field Action 15, which we call 40 acres and a mule, mule uh, lasted basically a year. I mean, uh, Lincoln authorized it through, through Secretary of War Stanton and General Sherman in 1865. Uh, January was um, was Field Action 15 in Savannah, Georgia, that allocated 400,000 acres um, in North Carolina, et cetera, that area along the coast. Uh, the, we worked that land so hard. The next month came a mule as a reward for it being industrious, black people being industrious. We didn't ask for a handout. We wanted to do for ourselves. We wanted the James Brown version of affirmative action. Open the door, I'll get it myself. I'm starting to preach. I guarantee I'm gonna get the details here in a minute. And the next month, uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the Freedmen's Bureau Act, which created the Freedmen's Bank, amongst other things, created Freedmen's Hospitals and Freedmen's uh, uh, Learning Facilities, uh, land-grant universities came uh, after that, You know what we now call HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, came after that. But a Freeman's Bank was created that third month, January the land, February the mule, March the bank, and then he promised blacks the right to vote. And Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April, which oddly enough was financial literacy month every year uh, in the modern era. And oddly enough, April is also the month that Dr. King was assassinated when he pivoted toward money. So I understand that the, that was a poor people's campaign in 1968, where he was standing next to my mentor and my dear friend, Ambassador Andrew Young, the last living lieutenant of Dr. King. As Dr. King, the dreamer was assassinated. They assassinated the dreamer, but not the dream. 1968, April, the, which is the last time that we really took a serious focus on money. And here was a pastor talking about money, right? So he was talking about, talking about a redistribution of wealth versus the creation of wealth. And I actually think that's one of the reasons he was assassinated, if not the primary reason, is he was going to Washington, D.C. to get his check. It was a march for jo jobs and freedom. Hello, a march for jobs and freedom. Jobs, hello, jobs first, right? We live in a free enterprise democracy, and Dr. King knew it. So, and they killed him before he got to his first march. He assassinated him. So, in the backdrop of all this, here comes this young man from South Central LA, me, talking about free enterprise, talking about capitalism, talking about, uh, you know, we can set ourselves free. In the backdrop of the story of just the, the modest history I just told you, and I didn't even go into post-slavery talking about the Jim Crow situation and sharecropping, which my grandfather, R.B. Smith, I cover this in the book Up From Nothing, and I mentioned it again in Financial Literacy for All. R.B. Smith, born in 1871, was born into sharecropping, where you work the land, but you never own it, and you can't get out of debt. It's like payday lending times 100, okay? And um, so I understand the trials and tribulations. And again, I don't I, the, all the false promises, you know, affirmative action created for African Americans, which was a watered down version of true economic empowerment that came after the the uh, uh, the war on poverty from from Johnson, who had who had put a real money and real resources to try to make things right. And then, of course, the Vietnam War got him distracted, sapped him, sapped him in the nation of its energy and his resources, and he shut these programs down. And so the affirmative action was a pivot uh, after that. And uh, that was watered down by the courts shut down. And that then, thank God, left to at least the empowerment of women. And it was initially white women who benefited from affirmative action. Um, and that was 1972, 1974. I covered that in a Time Magazine article I wrote on the untapped power of women and how women changed 
America and changed uh, by extension the world in 1970s. And to this day, or 25% of the GDP, gross domestic product in this country, like once again, these are just some antidotes on what has held up African Americans in particular, but whether you're African American or Latino or Asian uh, uh, and from an underserved part of Asia, a part, a group of Asians that don't get, uh, that were not, you know, did not come here to America with enormous resources uh, or help from home or relatives, uh, or if you're poor white, uh, I mean, there's all these groups that were left behind um, who may not uh, subscribe to um, this model that I was professing. By the way, out of all the ethnic groups in this country, and there were a couple hundred of them, there are a couple hundred of them that you can identify um, in this country that used mostly used free enterprise and capitalism to come up. Only three groups that were left behind did not use those tools. African Americans, um, not African Caribbeans, not African Africans, African Americans, right? Uh, Native American Indians and poor whites. So here I am coming out in with regard to one of these groups, one of the, these groups, African Americans initially, we now serve all three of those groups, by the way, we just opened the hope inside on a Native American Indian, uh, I don't know if it's a reservation, but it serves a reservation uh, land. Uh, we just opened that up with Wells Fargo uh, recently. We also serve poor white communities with First Horizon Bank and Regents Banks and others in the South and Truist, et cetera. Uh, but most of our locations have, you know, served the underserved African American population, a population that absolutely rejected what I'm talking about <laughs> for good reason. But nothing kept me down and nothing stopped me. I knew I had a vision and I knew it would work because it was a radical movement of common sense. But today I now recognize I was professing something that Ambassador that Ambas Young, Ambas Young on the brain, that my friend Quincy Jones told me, uh, which was prophetic. He said, John, it takes 20 years to change a culture. 20 years to change a culture. So it's you're, what you're about to hear is an overnight success in 20 years. So if you're listening to this in your car, you're about to get to the good part. I hopefully I inspired you with the first part. If you... Uh, are pressed for time, but you've listened to this thus far and you want the, your girlfriend or your best friend or your guy friend or your child to listen to this, but they have less time than you, you tell them to start at the 17 minute, 40 second mark, because that's when John gets to the goods on the how, what, and where of, of how he failed part one and how he fell forward. Here we go. So I founded Operation Hope in 1992 after the Rodney King riots. I will, sell, I will save the overall, how did I get it done? How did I start story for a separate podcast that I will do on how I built Operation Hope. So, so um, uh, wait for that one. Um, my first failure. So I, I raised $61,000, by the way, why am I bipartisan? I got it from a mayor, uh, mayor who was Democratic, who got it from a president who was Republican, Mayor Tom Bradley of Los Angeles uh, uh, asked then President George H.W. Bush, a Republican on his way out for to help this young man. And it was only $61,000 left in the outcoming, outgoing Bush administration and the SBA that the president could get his hands on. And I will forever be thankful for those two gentlemen um, for helping me get started with the $61,000 grant. I got it from the SBA, a, a, a 7J grant. So I started Operation Hope with that and plus some loans money. I loaned Operation Hope I then had got a chance to get a $600,000 grant from, um, I forget the name of the company, and probably good, I don't remember their name. Actually, I think it was U.S. Trust. Um, it was either U.S. Trust or Northern Trust. Um, and I had uh, applied for a grant for $600,000, 10%, 10 times my budget at that time. And they and I got I got an approval, right? This is right after the Rodney King riots. I was ecstatic. And then I found out that a councilman who I will not name because he is still a fixture in Los Angeles. And I don't want to make, I don't want to embarrass him, but uh, I was an advisor to this councilman in South Central LA. And as long as I was serving his district and him and his political needs, he, he was cool with me. But I said, I, my letter had said, you know, Operation Hope is going to eradicate poverty in the world. <laughs> and he's like, no, you're going to eradicate poverty in my district. And I was like, no, I'm, I mean, I'll include your district, but it's going to be in the world. 
uh, never, ne never shrink yourself to appeal to somebody who is small minded. Always stand your ground on purpose. If you you never go wrong doing right, even if you win the battle, even if you if they win the battle, you don't win the war. Or put another way, they may win the battle, but you will win the war. So uh, this person called the the bank committee head and 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 showed them a letter of resignation from my early board, my first board, uh, and discouraged them from giving me this grant. And you know they canceled that grant. $600,000. And I needed it. I had already planned for it to spend it. And they canceled that grant. I was devastated as, uh, you know, but over mess and not in it. Over it, around it, through it, you're going to get through it. Now, I, most people would have threw their hands up right there. You already, you already leased office space. You've hired people. You've, you know, you've got, you know, you, you here's this big bank that's given you a commitment. You, you, you wrote an excellent grant proposal and you did everything right. Did all the work. And for politics, and this person I'm talking about looked like me, by the way, the, who who told the bank, no, told the bank, you shouldn't do this. And he was the baller in that area in that time. And um, the bank didn't, the bank, the, the bank turned down my grant. And I had to find my own ground again, renew myself, uh, find my sense of enthusiasm and passion. I, uh, this is where self-esteem is so important. Self-esteem is different from confidence. Confidence is competence leaned out into the world. Self-esteem is how you esteem yourself. You've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's a big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around, comes around. Um, but I was full of love and I was full of, my, my mother, Juanita Smith, told me she loved me every day of my life. And as, as Quincy Jones, again, once said to me in another time, not one ounce of my self-esteem or self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. So it wasn't about other people de de deserving love. Love is what I had to offer. And so I I ignored the fact that, uh, that this uh, gentleman had did me wrong. And I assumed he meant well. He just wanted to do things his way. And I got in the way. And often you're going to be an accidental uh, uh, obstacle to somebody else who's trying to get the power, get the money, whatever. And you're in the way. Don't take it personal. Business is not personal. Business is business. It's a, it's a glad capitalism is a gladiator sport. Capitalism and power are gladiator sports and they're not for the faint of heart. And as you get further and further up that hill, the, the real estate gets smaller and smaller as you get further and further up the hill and you have people with bigger and bigger ambitions who want to be at the top of that hill and will knock you over, kick you, slip, make you slip, put, put putty, group, putty glue or, or, or liquid ice or something so you can't get there. They will cheat at success uh, to keep you down so they can stay up. And I believe in a win-win model, not a win-lose model. But love is work, non-love is laziness, and anti-love is evil. Evil exists, but it's very rare. Most people are just lazy. And, and so people will, will take shortcuts. And if you take the right route, ultimately you're going to win because you're going to be authentic and real and people ultimately invest in things and people that are authentic and real. It just takes more time. In my case, 20 years. Overnight success in 20 years. So in 1993, Marla Gibbs, got uh, uh, an actress uh, and community activist, owned the, the Vision Center complex in South Central LA. Um, in Lamert Park, and she rented uh, at a very affordable weight, rate a facility for us, and we opened the first Operation Hope, Operation Hope Vision Center. My brother Lance Triggs came to me, worked for me with for the with, for what was then a temporary job. He had left the airline industry and just needed a temporary job for six months. He's been with me now for uh, well, going on thirty years, <laughs> and he runs the the biggest platform in the country for for, for financial and economic empowerment for people of color. And that's his living legacy, came with a part-time job. But that first vision center didn't work. We did it. We ran it. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing, but we were trying because people were saying I was a lightweight and just about, I just I was giving speeches and I was talking a bunch of mess. The LA Times wrote horrible story articles about me. I was just this big mouth and I ran my mouth and, I said, and people, player hating on me. Oh my God. From the, I mean, from all angles in the black community, because again, I was messing with people's power. 
Uh, and and uh, they're trying to figure out, is he trying to run for office? Is he trying to be a politician? Like, what, he, he's trying to take our position, our place, our space. Again, it wasn't personal. I didn't take it personal. They just, they, I was in their way. And so um, uh, I just kept moving, kept my head down, right? And I remember Lance would call me and say, people keep coming in the office looking for eyeglasses, the Operation Hope Vision Center. <laughs> a different vision than I had in mind. So the next year, uh, I had an opportunity to upgrade my software. Um, there was a bank that was in trouble. It, this is where the story gets interesting now. There was a store, bank that was in store in trouble, Hawthorne Savings Bank. Doesn't exist anymore, I don't believe. Hawthorne Savings Bank was chaired by a now friend, um, Tim Chrisman. I didn't know him back then. The CEO of that bank was a guy who resembled a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and I say he was a racist. I don't know he was a racist. I, I, I'm not calling him a racist. I'm just saying his attitudes, his personality, the way he behaved, and his reputation was that that was a little salty, a little could be viewed as racist or just not very cool. So this is the last person I thought would be calling me to his office. He was in Hawthorne, California. I went to his office, and he asked me a bunch of questions, and I just was sure that this was going to end nowhere. I was completely frustrated. And when I walked out of the office, got to walk, stand up, I kept my cool. I, I went to stand up to leave. And he said, what would you do with a million dollars? And I had to keep my cool, right? And I, I turned and said, I would, in, I would stand up in Operation Hope Hopes. Uh, back then it was a Hope Banking Center in, right in the center of South Central Los Angeles. I would create homeowners and small business owners. I would put Hawthorne Savings name on it. Yep, the guy was a racist, and I would put their name, not his name, the bank's name on it because they were providing capital. And really, the color I needed was green. I didn't need the guy to like me. I needed I needed him to write a check. <laughs> it's okay if you don't like me. I like me, <laughs> right? You know, uh, and so um, and keep in mind, President Johnson was probably the most effective civil rights president in, it, it, you know, really going back to Abraham Lincoln, other than Abraham Lincoln, Four civil rights bills, one after uh, Dr. King was assassinated, the, the Housing Act. But he was, you know, he was not an elegant person. Uh, he was a, a bully. And he called blacks interesting things. He called Jews interesting things. He called women interesting names. Not, I mean, he would be castigated uh, in today's society. But that man with horrible bedside manner passed four civil rights bills, signed them in the law. Right, so you can't get caught up on drama, like, you know, uh, whether you like somebody and whether they like you and whether they've offended you. Look, are you are you are you going to step over a mess or step in it? Sometimes this stuff is a test from either the person or the universe or God trying to figure out are you serious about this or not. You know, do you know Ronald Reagan signed the bill for the Martin Luther King holiday we celebrate every year? Yes, right, Ronald Reagan. Do you know that uh, Red, President uh, George W. Bush, the son? has done more for Africa than any president before or since. So you've had you've had these democratic presidents we like uh, that maybe some of them didn't do much of anything. They I don't know why they didn't do much of anything. Um, and then you've had um, you've had some democratic presidents who've been extraordinary, like um, President Obama, President Clinton, who I think is a model, uh, President Johnson, President Kennedy was inspirational, right? But you also had some Republican presidents that were extraordinary, and you've had some Republican presidents that were absolutely horrible, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, President Reagan, President Reagan, President Lincoln was a Republican, right? So I believe in the bum factor. Twenty percent of Republicans are bums. Twenty percent of Democrats are bums. Twenty percent of people in my family are bums. <laughs> 20%, you know, of, of folks in the black community, the white community, the Latino community, the Asian community, the Indian community are bums. I'm not hating on any group of people. I don't like bums. So this guy, Scott Brawley, was not a bum because he wrote that check because he was in regulatory um, quagmire, knew he needed help, held his own nose. Once I passed the sniff test and asked his ridiculous questions, kept my cool. He wrote a million dollar check. This is 1996, I think. That's a lot of money. 1994. That's a lot of money. I think we opened in 96. He has a lot of money. And a lot of money now. Is, it, was, it, was, it was, I don't know, call it $20 million back then, equivalent of. So I, I had to hold my nose, right? Step over a mess, not in it. And, and, and 
so the the uncomfortable part of the meeting lasted an hour, hour and a half. I was ready to storm out. Um, but the the part where you committed a million dollars, I mean, I was standing up, asked asked a couple, answered a couple questions that took three minutes, and and they to his word, he wrote that check. And without that, I wouldn't have been able to open that first uh, operational banking center at thirty seven twenty one South La Brea Boulevard if I have the address correct. And then I met. Tim Christman, who became chairman of my board, who was chairman of their board. Uh, and I used to, yes, complain about Scott Brawley <laughs> to Scott's face and to Tim's face. I did it respectfully. But I, you know, I my motto in, lo- in life is talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. It becomes personal. Built that hope center, hit success. Then um, I, I, I wanted to expand the Hope Center and I wanted to put a cyber cafe, inner city cyber cafe for internet access back then um, in the cyber cafe. And and uh, we didn't have any money. And so I went to Washington, D.C. To, to look for money. And um, I was turned down wherever I went. <laughs> well, I went to Washington because I couldn't get money out of, out of anybody in California. Again, I wasn't really respected in Southern California. Where I was born, where I was raised, where I lived and where I built this thing. Again, I wasn't part of the establishment, so many people rolled their eyes at me. Um, so I had to go out of town to try to get capital, and I, drew, I flew to Washington, D.C. countless times from, I can't tell you how many times I did, I did the, the um, uh, what they call the midnight plane, the uh, red-eye flight. And I'd land in, in uh, t- just in time to change in the bathroom at the airport and go to a meeting. So um, at some point, I met Vice President Al Gore and knew he loved technology. And I kept trying to get to this man, kept trying to get to him. At this point, I think he was running for president, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And finally, I got in front of him uh, at his residence, the vice president's residence. And I gave him my vision. You know, And mind you, I've been, been trying now for a couple of years to get his attention unsuccessfully. And I knew he was a techie. So I, um, and, and Vice President Gore is probably right why we have the internet today, by the way, um, or email. Well, no, email on the internet. He doesn't get credit for it. It was originally a government. Uh, that was, those were government uh, it, um, solutions that came out of the military that they uh, commercialized. Okay, so um, he listens to my vision and he says, "Well, great. I think this is great. Um, uh, I'm going to come out in a couple weeks and uh, and I'll cut the ribbon for you." And I was like, "All I just said was yes." <laughs> so I leave there and I don't remember the exact. Uh, chronology here, but I know I called the uh, EDA, the Economic Development Administration. And I said the Vice President of the United States of America is coming out in, to cut a ribbon for a Hope Center that I don't have built and I need money for. And I think and, and I, I think the government's going to be embarrassed if you don't support this. The, the Vice President's coming out. And what do you need? I, 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 again, I forget the numbers. Let's just say it was three hundred thousand. I needed six hundred thousand dollars, so I needed the government to put up three hundred thousand dollars. So he, so the government did. <laughs> But you got to match this funds. So then I went and called Steve Ryan, who's my attorney to this day uh, in the board of Operation Hope. And I, he didn't know me. And uh, I told him my vision. I knew he represented tech companies. And he's like, who is this? Who are you on the phone? And I'm like, look, you represent this company, that company, this company. You're the lobbyist in Washington. Don't you want your your companies to look good in front of the government? I got the, the vice president of the United States coming out. I got the, the EDA, US EDA to make a commitment. Uh, but it needs a matching grant. And And he's like, look, meet me in New York. But, you know, my wife and I are going to be there, meet us at at this restaurant. I think it was the next day. I flew out and I met him at a bar. And I hate bars. I met him at a bar, gave him my vision. His wife checked me out. I now know that was the case. And she said I was okay. And he said, okay, I'm going to arrange a conference call for you. So with some tech companies. And they're on the phone. And I gave him my vision. And I remember a lady got on the phone from one of the tech companies and said, this is impossible. It'll never happen. And I said, get off the phone immediately. Please, please, please exit the line. Like, if you don't believe you're wasting your time, uh, by virtue, you're wasting all of our, all of ours, because the people only have 20 minutes on the line. But I need to be able to have the rest of the time to explain to them, to those who are willing to listen, what I am uh, trying and what I will do. So will you please exit the line? Thank you very much. I didn't scream at her, raise my voice, or curse her out, even though she deserved it. She was she on the line to be rude. She got on the phone to say that this didn't work. So she exits the line. And I gave my best passionate pitch for, you know, five to seven minutes. I shut up. 
And then each company starts saying, well, we don't have money. We can't get money to you this quickly. I said, well, that's fine. Uh, I, I need uh, software. I need computers. I need I need cables. I need and so they're like, oh, we can do computers. Oh, well, we can do software. So you know, and um, the, the one of the companies was into it. Um, uh, at that time, we made they made Quicken, QuickBooks, and Quicken, and they gave me some software. To this day, they are one of my partners. Thirty years later, and their then chairman, um, an incredible uh, human being, uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, who I will always be appreciative of. Uh, Mr. Smith is uh, uh, now in charge of a major university in West Virginia, um, and he is a million-dollar donor, personally, uh, to Operation Hope. Um, uh, um, to our 1865 project. And um, just a wonderful human being. And but it started, it started, you know, back then in this relationship. Right. And, uh, I get the $300,000 and I called a construction company and told them Turner construction company. <laughs> and, uh, I told them my, uh, my, my dream. And, uh, they're like, well, you know, why should we do this? I said, well, I got the government coming, the vice president of the United States, by the way, is Brad Smith, who's now uh, president of the biggest university in West Virginia, and um, I think he's you know almost a billionaire, um, and 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 you know, again just put a million dollars into Operation Hope, but cumulatively, cumulatively to into it, put millions and millions of dollars into Operation Hope from this first little in kind grant of some software. So uh, I called Turner Construction, didn't know. Told him like the vice president of the United States coming. I've got these major companies uh, and the U.S. government <laughs> made a commitment, and I need for them to do this. Uh, and they said, "What are we going to pay?" I said, "No, you're doing it. I'd like you to do it in kind. I'll give you a charitable grant receipt. You look good in front of the federal government. You look good for these tech companies. You look good in front of the community. Don't you have a community relations commitment and budget?" So <laughs> they did it for cost, um, and I built the cyber cafe and the Secret Service came out. I literally one day, my president back then was Fred Smith. I remember one day the construction company was out there. They're like, what do we do? This is a, it was a retail a complex. You know, what do we, how, what do we start? I just took my hand in the middle of the building and said, well, bu bulldoze this part. I think it was the North part. <laughs> just cut the hope inside banking center down the center and bulldoze the right side, bulldoze the right side. Where are your permits? I'll get to that. <laughs> of course, I went down the city and said, like, I got the vice president of the United States. I've got the U.S. federal government. I got all these tech companies. I got Turner Construction. I got the community behind me. I got a petition of all the folks in the community. I need a permit for a cyber cafe because we need internet access in South Central LA. I got the permit. So the Secret Service shows up in, in the middle of a construction site to do advance work for the vice president. And they're like, what the heck's going on here? And we're like, this is a, this is a cyber cafe. We, we can't do a review in front. Sure you can. You can see right through the walls. Well, aren't you here for security? You're not here for protocol. You're not here to criticize whether, you know, whether I get it done on time. It will be done on time before the vice president gets here. You want to make sure it's secure. There's no bombs in the walls. You can look right through the walls. <laughs> so they approved it. And within a week, the vice president of the United States had come out and cut the ribbon in that cyber cafe. Um, it's a more complicated story than that, but I think you get the gist. And, uh, and so you think that, okay, we've got success. Well, th there were, th there was success until it wasn't. You go far enough in the North Pole, you end up South. I then get, so here's some more momentum. I then get E-Trade in 2001, who puts up seven figure commitment um, to open up because they had re regulatory problems with the federal regu banking regulators. They were a non-branch bank. They were online only. So I was going to be their only as you can see, I've always turned somebody else's problem to my opportunity. So I was going to be their branch network in the community or in any community. And so they put up a seven figure commitment to build an Operation Hope banking center powered by E-Trade. And we had one in Anacostia. I believe it was our first one ever. And, and we had one in Harlem. Um, and uh, I think it was on the corner of Frederick Douglass and something in Harlem. Uh, and um, we had ultimately 11 Hope uh, banking center locations funded by E-Trade. And over uh, a uh, 12, 13-year period, 
there were seven CEOs that I had to go through, each of which I had to resell, resell on this vision. Now, I haven't gotten to the ultimate failure yet. This, this is the warm up. So, uh, 2001, this the partnership started. Crystal Kosovos, uh, uh, he was CEO for uh, until 2003. I, I conv convinced him uh, that this should happen. And um, then there was a guy named Arlen Gelbard who was there, who was uh, sort of my anchor. Every one of these institutions and partners, there's always a believer, a true believer somewhere in the company. He may, he or she may not be the power broker, but they are a true believer and they help me understand where the bodies are buried and what to avoid and what to focus on and, and what the personality is of the CEO and all that kind of stuff. So Arlen, thank you very much. So Christoph's served in 2003, he said yes. Then, I, then Mitchell Kaplan came in and he was CEO until 2007, and I convinced him, and he said yes. Each of these were renewing seven-figure commitments for these hope and side to, to, to fund them, to keep them open. Then came uh, Jared Lillian, and he was acting CEO for a short time. Then came Donald Layton, who appointed was appointed in 2008 and served for a year to 2009. I, I he was only there for a year, but I had to sell him. Then came... And you can't get upset. You can't get frustrated. You can't say, I've already sold the last person. Nobody cares, right? What I tell you is capitalism is a gladiator sport. Here comes Robert Druskin, uh, who served as interim CEO from 2009 to 2010. Then here comes Stephen Freiberg, uh, who was from 2010 to 2012. That was two years CEO. Here comes Paul Idzik, uh, who assumed the role from 2013 to 2016. Now, I can't be certain, but I'm pretty sure that it was Paul that cut my throat. <laughs> <laughs> so the, e Trade was having some horrible financial problems. I don't blame them. They were having horrible financial problems. Had to restructure the whole company to cut out $100 million of spending. Guess what got cut, right? What, guess what was on the first thing on the chopping block? So this new CEO came in, like, what's this hope and Operation Hope stuff? We're spending how much money? Well, no, a million something a year? We can't do that. And uh, so I got to notice that the, the, they, the, <laughs> they never wanted me to go and meet with the CEO because they always knew if I was, if I met with the CEO, I'd find a way to separate them from their wallet. So they would not let me meet with this guy. The answer was just no. I got a letter, an email. Uh, sorry to tell you da, da, da. I had to negotiate a transition period. They would fund it for another uh, a year. They wouldn't just drop me. They wanted to drop me within a few weeks. You, you, you can't, I got payroll, this and that, and the other thing. You can't just drop me. Um, you, you need time to find a new partner, new sponsor. So they gave me as much as a year, um, to transition out so they didn't have any embarrassment on their end and more regulatory problems. And I got a lifeline. So <clears throat> now it's 2014. This is where it gets interesting. At 2014, <clears throat> E-Trade dumps me on my head. And uh, I, call, I remember it was a Friday evening and I called my staff. My team was Friday evening, 6 p.m. I remember I was driving up to my house, my old house here in Atlanta on Moheb Street. And I called my team. I said, I need to meet with you uh, all that are available. Was this, wait a minute. Was this Atlanta? Yeah, I was in Atlanta. I need to meet with everybody who's available um, in person or by phone. It's it's important. It's urgent, actually. Now, this was a bit of a relief, relief that I got canceled from E-Trade because I also knew that my business model was not sustainable. So I had these boxes, these hope inside banking centers. Like, don't be committed to... Uh, don't be rabidly, rigidly committed to anything. Be flexible. Be, you know, why is a drunk driver not get hurt in these accidents? They're flexible. They're fluid. They're, they're loose. I'm not promoting drunk. I'm not. In fact, I'm horrible. I think drunk driving is a horrible thing. I'm just saying that one of the benefits of being drunk is that you're loose. So they, you know, oftentimes they don't get hurt. Where where the person who's sober, it just, you know, rig, gets really rigid and grams that steering wheel, and they and of course they they get broken up, and so. I was rigidly, I, I was not rigidly attached to, to anything other than success and upgrading my software. I, I believe God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you listen twice as much as you talk. And um, and I knew this business model wouldn't work. I mean, I I, I paid the landlord, I paid the janitorial services, I paid I paid I try to get minority vendors to you know to fund the minority vendors. It's all my minority vendors, my vendors for these for these places where I rented these boxes, these five thousand square foot boxes I rented Hope Empowerment Centers. Um, which had a cyber cafe in it at that point, uh, and a counseling center and all that stuff. But I paid all, paid all the utilities, all the bills, whatever. I was going broke. I had more money going out than coming in. The sponsorship money wasn't covering it. 
I had no surplus. And the janitor starts suing me because I wasn't paying them on time. This was a minority janitor, a janitorial company I hired to try to serve the community and help the community. They sued me, rightly so. I wasn't paying on time. And they're like, well, you're a bum. <laughs> right? Not E-Trade was a bum. I was a bum. E-Trade's name was on the on the side of it, on the, on, the, on the outside, but I was the one who made sure that we hired minority vendors. And so it was personal to them, to me, like tell John Bryan to pay this bill. So I'm like, how did I get here? No good deed shall go unpunished. And I'm like, that's got to be a better model. And then my employees told me, by the way, we got to tell you, even poor people don't want to come to a location that seems to serve poor people. <laughs> and middle class people definitely don't. So on top of all that, I had these locations, 11 of them, that that were getting decent engagement in traffic. We had to go out in the community to get the clients. They wouldn't want to come into the center unless they're using the cyber cafe because it was known as a place that solved or served the poor. <laughs> I learned all kinds of lessons in this example. So I said to my team, um, how many locations do we have? 11 locations. Okay. How many of these locations are unsustainable? 10 of them. Wait a minute. Hold on. You're telling me before each rate uh, cut our cut cut my throat, cut our cut our economic lifeline. And I'm thankful for E-Trade, by the way. They did what nobody else would do for a decade. You're telling me that that before they cut the funding, that these models were unsustainable. Yes, we were deficit funding them. So, okay, we're going to close every location that is not taking care of itself. You, this, this look on people's face on this Friday night was, was, was pure terror. What's the one location that is working? Well, it's a location with Bank of the West. It's in California, in Oakland in the Fruitvale area, uh, I think it's called Fruitvale Station. Uh, why is it working? Well, I remember I cut the deal with the CEO. I asked him for a million, a million I, I had a shtick. <laughs> I want a million, million and a half, it had to have seven figures to build a Hope Center and run it for three or four years. And um, the CEO said, no, it was Don McGrath. And then Michael Shepard after that, but it was Don McGrath, I remember he was, I, I love Don McGrath. Don was like, I love you, John, but no, I'm not giving you any money. Uh, tell you what I'll do. I mean, I will build the center for you. Uh, we're building a branch. Uh, you've inspired me to build a branch in, in an underserved area. I'll build the branch. I'll let you have, um, uh, I'll give you half the branch. You can lo co-locate with there with me. Deal? I'm like, yeah, yes, deal. Best move I could have ever made. Why? I had no utility payments anymore. I had no lease payments there anymore. I had no janitorial payments anymore. That was all Don's problem, right? Now I'm a software company, right? I'm providing solutions and I put a sign on the wall in the bank, no loans denied. The silver rights movement, the sign was in silver, no loans denied. We gotta find that sign, it's historic. I gotta get it, get it up, put it in our archive. You were approved day one from Operation Hope, subject to the resolution of your primary denial factors. And my coaches would reverse engineer you into a loan approval, walk you across the, the aisle to the bank branch um, and get you approved for a loan. And uh, we paid we paid nothing and they paid me enough money to pay my staff. So they sent me a check for a few hundred thousand dollars a year, but I had no, no bills. Whereas before I had a grant check coming to me, but my bills were, you know, 30% higher than the money I received from the, from, from my, from, from the sponsor. So when your outflow exceeds your inflow, then your overhead will be your downfall. That's financial literacy one-on-one. -on -one. Can I get an amen? So this was a blessing. And so I said, to, I said well, we're going to model everything on this Bank of the West branch in Oakland. Um, this is what I want everything to, this is what I want every, everything to look like. So then I flew back to, to uh, home, to Atlanta. I, lived, I grew up in L.A., but at this point I lived in Atlanta, thanks to Ambassador Young. I remember Ambassador Young told me um, one day, I brought him in to meet a mayor. I won't say which one. Uh, he, he, and um, he's still around. And uh, he asked me to meet with Master Young. I brought Ambassador Young in. And um, he let me sit on the floor. The mayor did in the meeting. This is a meeting he requested with Ambassador Andrew Young that I, rec that I arranged. And that was a power play <laughs> because people thought this young, charismatic guy who can raise money, he's going to try to run for office. And so this was, these were power plays to, to send a message to me to put me in my space, in my place. So I take the meetings over. I sit on the floor. I didn't mind. Gave me good, good stretching, good exercise. Uh, I'm still in good shape. <laughs> and so I, I took Ambassador Young to the airport and he says, you know, you, you got to move out of LA, right? Excuse me? He said, John, everybody thinks you're going to run for mayor or councilman or governor or whatever. They, they don't want to believe you're just doing this for the right reasons. He said, you know, uh, even Jesus has said in the Bible 
that a prophet is only without honor in his own hometown. He said, do you, 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 do you remember how little Dr. King got done in Atlanta? They called him Marty ML. Uh, they called him, you know, they never called him Dr. King in Atlanta because they player hated him and he couldn't get anything done in Atlanta. He got things done outside of Atlanta. He said, a prophet is only without honor in his own hometown. You got to leave LA, go do some great things someplace else, come back as an honored citizen later as a guest. That's what I did. I moved to Atlanta. It worked like a charm. And so um, he was right <laughs> again. So, um, so uh, uh, I did this deal with, uh, I went back to Atlanta and met with the bank, uh, the CEO of um, SunTrust Bank, which is now Truist, Bill Rogers. He didn't like me initially either. <laughs> I mean, he liked me, but he was trying to figure out whether he could trust me with some money, right? And that, that was, again, instincts were all right. That's what bankers are supposed to do is check you out. And Jim Wales, who was the original CEO, who I fell in love with, I uh, love Jim Wales. He's retired now. Um, and that's another story for when I talk about Operation Hope and unpack that. Um, uh, Bill, Bill, Jim Wells introduced me to Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers took a long time to warm up to me, but we warmed up. We're dear friends now. Um, and uh, he became president of, of SunTrust and then CEO. And um, I went to him with this vision. I want to bring hope inside of SunTrust, then SunTrust, now Truist. And he's like, hmm, interesting idea. What would you do? I said, I want to create new customers for you, get you out of the no business because you're saying no to people who got bad credit high debt to income ratios and low levels of savings who are good people who want to be homeowners and small business owners, but they're unqualified and they assume you're discriminated against them. They assume you're racist, right? And you're just meeting, you, you, what you can't tell them is they don't meet your bank criteria. And he said, you're going to create customers? Yep. And it's going to comply with Community Reinvestment Act. And it's going to comply with the law. And you're going to be a hero in your community. Win, win, win. Okay. Tell you what, I'll do it. Okay, I need a I need a loan for a grant for no 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 I'm not giving you any money. <laughs> this became a theme. I'm not giving you money. They want you, they want to see if I was serious. I'll put you in two of my branches, and see how it goes. And um, okay, I just said yes. And we put him to we put in two of his branches. Uh, he covered no he covered my costs. No, I covered my costs. He reimbursed me after a year year and a half. He was working. He did reimburse me every dime, but. But initially, this big bank, I had to put up my own money to try this model, and I had to go to the federal gov government and get approval to operate inside of a bank branch. It had never been done before. No nonprofit has operated inside of a bank branch in American history before Operation Hope. And to this day, we're the only one. So um, again, we have time for all the story. I want to make this sure this podcast is not much longer. I hope you're enjoying this. Let me know. So um, I come back after two years, year and a half, with my, my data and my results. And he says, that's great. Now I'm thinking, I want to go from two locations to 20. That was my dream. And he's like, this has really worked. Um, you did a good job. I'm going to give you a grant to cover your costs. Thank you very much for all you've done. And I had an advocate inside of the bank at the time. Um, and they got and they came back and said, we're going to do 200 locations. I went from two. So I went from 11 down to one, up to two, to three to 200. Um, then um, I, I tried to take that model to another bank, um, Regions Bank, and I had an advocate over there uh, as well, um, Rick Swagler, um, and he wanted me to win, but the general counsel did not. And the general counsel was like, I don't, this is too risky. We can't have the nonprofit inside of our bank branches. And I was told this was the issue, so I told the CEO who, uh, uh, like me. And the CEO went over to the general counsel and said, why? So why won't you let John Bryan's operational operations out of our bank branches? Well, I just think it's too risky. Well, what's on a scale of one to 10? How risky is this? It's a two. <laughs> a two out of a scale of two, one to 10, 10 being worse. The CEO said, look, just say yes. Just just let the guy operate. If, if they screw it up, we, we can get over it. It's one bank branch. So I turned that into performing there. I then had to go to the federal government, the FFIEC, the federal all the federal regulatory agencies to get approval to operate inside of a bank branch and allow the banks to get Community Reinvestment Act credit for it, um, which they forced me to do, but it was the right thing to do. And I ended up getting a, look, a commitment for 100 locations from Regions Bank, and uh, God bless them, biggest bank in Alabama. Come back to, to, um, to this uh, uh, SunTrust. So then SunTrust gets merged or, with another bank, and it becomes Truist, and... Um, 
Today we have uh, a commitment from them to be in uh, half of all their branches. There are 2,000 branches at Truist. We are currently in 800 branches. 50 physical branches. By the way, they have a brother over working there, Dante, uh, 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 who is the um, uh, the chief banking officer uh, for the bank. And I believe uh, he is the highest ranking African-American in the country, Dante Wilson, uh, in such a role. In any, this, this is the sixth, fifth or sixth largest bank in America. And this was Bill Rogers being intentional about diversity and inclusion, by the way, because it's just good business sense, not because it's a label. So um, we're, we today um, have, uh, so we're in 800 of the 2,000 branches because we're creating new customers for the bank helping them comply with Community Reinvestment Act and other regulatory issues. Uh, you know, it's doing well and doing good. The employees feel good about it. The customers feel good about it. And we are creating customers for them. It's a business model. And as a result of that, they pay us a annual membership fee and a partnership fee that allows me to cover my expenses plus a modest profit of 15%. And that's how I make my budget. And I have uh, 300 locations, physical locations across the country now and 1,500 total satellite and physical locations. I'm the largest financial literacy coaching organization in America. My budget is now 70 plus million dollars a year, uh, up from that budget of $61,000 that I mentioned to you. But I couldn't get angry. I couldn't get upset. I couldn't step in mess. I had to step over it. I couldn't get reactive. I had to respond, not react. I couldn't be disappointed by people who had their own agenda. I could not assume somebody was racist because they had, they were small-minded or narrow-minded. I could not take it personal when somebody, uh, a big major corporation, didn't want to cover my startup costs as an entrepreneur. It wasn't their problem. It was mine. I, and, but I should be happy and appreciative. They let me in the door and gave me a shot. I'll tell you something else. Somebody else that gave me a shot that didn't look like a shot initially. Um, this, so I, I told, I've, told, I've given you examples now where a couple times these big banks, big corporations were like, no, we're not writing you a check. We'll give you a place to operate. So, uh, I went to eat to Ed Bastion. This is bonus track now for this, 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 this first lesson of my failures is now over, but, uh, it, but, and by the way, we have a four star charity navigator rating with charity navigator, which is like the bond rating or the credit rating organization for wall street, but for nonprofits. You can't get better than four stars. We have 88 cents of every dollar at Opera Show goes right to the bottom line of the programs. So we have just enough. We have so efficient that we have to add a membership program on top operations, hopes pro partnership programs because the partnerships run so lean and so efficient that we don't have enough money left over to grow the organization and, and the overhead and all that kind of stuff and have new technology. So we create a membership organization on top of that or parallel to that called the 1865 Project, which is going extraordinarily well. That's what Brad Smith and others have signed on to support the work as members. It's kind of a Costco model. You, you become a member and you can go shopping. You become a member, now you can partner. Um, and so it's four-star charity navigator rating. Um, in the midst of all this growth, we have excellent financials that stand up to anybody's scrutiny. So no matter, it doesn't matter whether you like me or not, the whole Scott Brawley thing from you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, do you respect me? I'd rather you respect me and learn to like me than like me and never respect me. Can I get an amen? Here's the bonus track. By the way, send me a note, put something, if you see, if you watch this on social media or one of the platforms in addition to the podcast or YouTube or whatever, please make a comment of what you liked about this podcast and what you would have liked me to uncover or I didn't explain. I can, and when I unpack, when I do my financial literacy live book events uh, on Facebook and LinkedIn. I will cover it for Financial Literacy for All, my book. I'll cover the questions that I see noted. Here's the bonus track. Um, Ed Bastian, CEO of Delta, a uh, good friend. I love the guy. Uh, and um, I wanted to do Hope Inside the Workplace for employees. And I gave him my spiel and my, my pitch. He said, that sounds really good. I think we should do that. And he told me who to call. So I called Joanne Smith. Uh, the global chief HR officer who had her own power. And she's like, uh, I think we're good. I think we got some way, you know, this program is here already. And I'm like, well, that program only helps pilots and wealthy executives. I mean, they're investing, that company's investing investable assets. The people I'm talking about, the employees I'm talking about got too much month into their money. They don't have any investable assets. They got cutoff notices, pink slips, <laughs> right? And their credits toe up and flow up like mine was. And she's like, no, I think we're good. 
I said, okay, well, can I do a pilot inside of Delta? Huh? Yeah. Just let me do a pilot and I'll pay for it. Okay. See the theme? So I would do a pilot inside of Delta Airlines and for 18 months and I pay for it. At the end, again, it's one of the biggest airlines in the world. I pay for it. It's a small nonprofit. We produce results, keep sending reports to Joanne and she's listening and she's reading them, but there's no action. I keep doing it, right? Keep reporting out, keep stay focused, stay consistent. Yeah, you, you, you know, you don't win a baseball game with home runs. There's base hits and bunts, right? Yeah, that add up. Uh, and a score is a score. Whether it's sexy or it's or or boring, a, a point is a point. A score is a score is a score, right? A goal is a goal, right? So pandemic hits and um, they get a billion dollars of withdrawals, emergency withdrawals from their 401k plan from their employees overnight. No no protesting, no no warning, no screaming, no hollering. People just hitting their computer at midnight because they were te- petrified, their employees. I get a call the next day. John, how quickly can you be nationwide? Excuse me? Yeah, I, I get it now. We, 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 we missed it and you did and you caught it and that your work works and I need your help. And uh, I said, thank you to her. I mean, that late, it took a lot of courage and a lot of wisdom. And I've told her this privately and publicly. This wouldn't have, it wouldn't have worked if Ed had just shoved it down everybody's throat. It, it wouldn't have worked if it was by dictator, or whatever. It worked. It, I had to prove it. And I, and this lady would have resented me if I had gone over her head, right? I, Ed got me to the door, but I had to get through the door myself. Again, I believe in the James Brown version of affirmative action. Open a door, I'll get it myself. Joanne and I worked together on a, on a program that is now a model for the whole corporate sector. Uh, half of the employees have gone through our program at Delta, half of the 100,000 employees. Uh, they love the program so much, they put aside an emergency savings account, emergency savings account program for employees of $1,000. You go through the financial literacy program and you get a $1,000 grant for an emergency savings because 40, 64% of Americans don't have $400 for an unplanned event of all colors, of all stripes, of all economic uh, levels. And we all learned a lot of lessons. Half of those making $100,000 a year are living from paycheck to paycheck. The 30 of those making $250,000 a year, paycheck to paycheck. 70% of Americans living from paycheck to paycheck. Everybody, whether you're white, black, red, brown, or yellow, you want to see some more green. So we created this, this program and very highly successful. The, you can go to Delta Financial Wellness. I think it's yeah, deltawellness.com, I believe it was. Or go to Operation Hope, which is Del, or just search Operation Hope and Delta Hope inside the workplace model. The data, it was unbelievable of how this has transformed transform their employees' lives. And, and now we're about to start a new program with them that's even more exciting. Stand by for that. Rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. Um, and by the way, Delta now is the biggest airline in the world, the most powerful, the, mo- the wealthiest airline in the world, the, busiest air, bus- the biggest air- airline in the world, operating at the busiest airport in the world, and the most profitable airline in the world. Um, and a leader in their space, and they do share hope, they do profit sharing with their employees every Valentine's Day to do a couple billion dollars of profit sharing. So once they meet their, their, their requirements for their shareholders and they share the rest of the profits with their employees and they do financial coaching on the bottom end to make sure nobody falls through the cracks, that's what we do with them. We're getting credit scores up, debt down, savings up with their employees, which gives them confidence. I believe the financial literacy coaching is what healthcare was 40, 50 years ago, 50 years ago. I think it's a new imperative. People are stressed the heck out about money. And I'm trying to believe that, but you got to believe that. And the first believer had to be me. Um, But it took me 20 years to be an overnight success. And I'm trying to make sure that you can do it in less than that. Uh, And if it takes you that long, I want you to know that there is a rainbow at the end of this storm. Uh, But hopefully I can turn my 20 years into your two. But in however however long it takes, I want you to remain encouraged and, and, um, and know uh, that you're enough all by yourself. John O'Brien, this is Money and Wealth, and this is the first part of How I Failed, part one. Failing, falling, forward.